Hello, Booktube. I've been hitting one technical snag after another on this channel today. It's been pretty hairy. <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't even know where to begin. I briefly flirted with using my new burner phone. I got a $15 burner cell phone online to once again try to have some ability to phone call the outside world. <laughs> okay, because I had an iPhone 6. And I have an iPhone 6, and I absolutely love it. I absolutely love it as a device. And it, I put a SIM card in it, and I thought, okay, well, I will get a, a phone plan that allows me to refill as I go along. I don't use the phone hardly at all. I don't need a monthly plan that's extortionate. I don't need anything like that. I can just refill it as I go along. And that worked for a long time. Then it stopped working. No idea why. Just... Uh, I did the usual pressing of the buttons in order to read, in order to put, you know, 10 or $20 back in my account. And the whole thing said, does not compute, does not compute. And by then, I, I so I looked online to find out what the problem with that could be. And one, one source online, one thing, one tip that was repeated over and over again is that it might need a different SIM card. There might be something wrong with the SIM card that was in the phone. So I ordered a new SIM card extracted the old one, put the new one in. A lot of you are going to think that's very commonplace. Try doing it with no sense of touch. It's not exactly commonplace. It's a nightmare, but it worked. Still didn't work. Phone will do everything else. It'll do everything else just fine, but it will not call out even an emergency, even the emergency number. It won't do anything. So I knew that I had to take it to uh, the shop. I had to take it to an AT&T shop here in America, a, a sort of a help center where you can get one of the dudes there to uh, look at it and fix it for you only i realized that i realized that definitively okay this is going to have to happen i'm going to have to do this it, it's you're sinking two or three hours into it you just stand around waiting uh, the time when i finally came to the realization that i would have to do that uh, was the beginning of the pandemic when not only was there initially no chance whatsoever that I was going to sit in an enclosed space with a, bunch, with a bunch of strangers for three or four hours, but also then immediately after that, there was no op opportunity to do that. The stores were all closed. So I went the whole of the pandemic without the phone working as a phone. And then in the, in the winter, I thought, okay, well, it, this bears no sign of ending. So... Uh, why don't you get a burner phone? You're not wedded to this phone. Get a, a cheap cell phone that already comes with a SIM card that is designed to be hooked up and used right away without the use of a showroom. So I did that. I got one, and just for safekeeping, I got two. And I started using the first one, set it all up. I think I talked about it on this channel. Remarkable device. Just remarkable. Considering how cheap it was. Just in a very good uh, handheld computer just very very good and i put the sim card in and i the sim card was in it i activated it i got an account online and it seemed to work i made three phone calls and then it stopped working then the machine stopped working and i went on various help forums online and was told no 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 with an iphone yes maybe but with one of these no there's no it, it didn't stop working <laughs> it did stop working so i went to the backup phone the second burner phone that i got at the same time anticipating some nightmare like this and it didn't work at all sim card or no sim card it didn't work at all and i was nauseated of course i have those things just sitting in the in the bottomless tech drawer and i thought okay enough of this you know there's zoom by now there was zoom and there's voxer do you really need a phone all that much but every once in a while the need for a phone crops up and it's nonsense to think that i'm the only person in the world who can't have one so i, I but once again e the showrooms weren't open and even if they were i would still have not been very confident now things are very different now uh infection rates for COVID are going down in america instead of up now that we don't have a a, a gibbering psychopath as the leader of the whole effort uh, and on top of that, I am fully vaccinated. So I, I might be okay with that now, but I haven't even checked to see if the AT&T store in Boston is open. It's still a sink of time, and I don't like that. I'm not allowed to bring herself. They don't want you at the AT&T store. They don't, baby. <laughs> uh, so it would still be a huge sink of time, and I don't I didn't want to do that. Uh, so I thought, well, okay, why not just buy another burner phone? 
Like, what, what can possibly go wrong a third time? And I did. I even have a prop here. <laughs> I did. I bought a, thir a third burner phone. Uh, and I set it up. It had a SIM card in it. I went online. I, I made my account. I put in some money. And it works just fine. This has been days now, and it has not quit on me. It works just fine. It gives me a phone number. It gives me a phone that can be reached by other people. It gives me the ability to call other people. Wonderful. Just wonderful. And then I thought, well, okay, it, it has everything on it that I would want. I mean, it can play YouTube. It can. I can scroll through Instagram. I can take pictures and put them on Instagram with this device. Why would I even... I, thought, I started to think, why do I even need my iPhone? Surely I can film booktube videos on this burner phone. Uh, and so I did. I checked the internal storage. There was about 10 gigs of space that was open. And that's plenty, especially if I'm being conscientious about erasing the videos once they're uploaded. So I made some videos. You've seen some of them on, on this channel. Uh, by all accounts, from what I've been able to, to hear from comments, the audio was much better with the burner phone. And the video was just fine. Maybe a little dark, maybe a little bit on the dark side, but that might have just been the time of day. Uh, and it, I should have suspected right there that was awful smooth sailing. I don't have smooth sailing when it comes to technology. I just don't. And uh, sure enough, the burner phone still works as a phone. It hasn't stopped doing that. But it's it, now when I check the internal storage, there's none. There's no internal storage space left. It's just maxed out at 100%. Like 99%. There's no way, there's no room for even one video. Much less the more than one video that I tend to make a day. <laughs> and <laughs> I haven't done anything to it from the time when I checked the storage and there was ample space, 10 gigs of space. From that time to this time, I have not done anything. It's not like I've added, you know, PlayStation 4 or whatever. I haven't changed anything. My suspicion is that the videos that I've taken on the phone are still on the phone, even though I've moved them to the trash. On the iPhone, if you move videos to, to the trash, if you select them and move them to the trash icon, they're not gone. They're still eating up your internal storage. You have to then go to trash and manually decide to empty it. I'm, I'd be willing to bet that there is such a procedure on this phone that I just have not been able to discover. I've gone online. Of course, it was the first thing I did was go online and say, how do you empty trash on a track phone? That's what this is. It's a track phone. It's a burner phone. And all of them said, well, go to locations. And in locations, you'll see trash. Then click on trash and hit empty. Of course, the phone doesn't have locations. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't have a folder like that. So your help does me no good. I haven't dug around yet in the tech forums on Reddit or anything like that to find out what the actual answer is. But I bet that's what's going on here. Because I haven't added anything. The same roster of apps that was taking up 10 gigs of space uh, a week ago is still there with no additions. So, so it has to be those videos. They have to be the thing taking up the space. They're probably in the trash and just not deleted. So I need to figure that out. And, and in the meantime, I thought, well, okay, so you'll go back to using your iPhone to make videos. But what if you used your iPad? Here, do I have another prop? Yes, I do. My wonderful, wonderful iPad with the uh, the smart keyboard uh, that unfolds into a... See, so you, can, you can unfold it like that, set it up on a keyboard. Keyboard is a heavenly experience to type on. And thanks to the new iOS changes on the, the iPad, uh, multitasking is now more possible than it ever was. That was one of the main problems to me in using the iPad as a computer was that it was almost impossible to multitask. And now it is possible to multitask. You can split the screen, and you can also have a third column that rotates, a third column of small apps that you can consult and then move off screen so it's not in your way. Uh, I use this thing all the time. I live on it, uh, and I love it. And I thought, okay, well, it has a huge amount of storage. That's the reason that I bought it. I was keeping careful eye on that feature instead of just getting the baseline. I paid for a gigantic amount of storage on this thing. And it has this huge amount of storage left on it. And I thought, okay, well, what about that? What about filming on that iPad? And I even have a, one of those, one of the only pieces of equipment that I've bought for this channel. It's a huge iPad tripod with a, a sort of a screw on clamp at one end and a bracket on the other that holds the iPad. So you can, you can clamp the thing on anywhere. I've actually used it on this channel. 
I have filmed videos on this iPad, on this channel, both in the little book room and over on the book wall. Uh, and there was no problem at all. I stopped, I think, because I was the, I was in a location where it wasn't convenient, so I just went back to the phone and stuck there. Uh, but then I thought, you know, in the midst of this tech, tech apocalypse that I've been having, I thought, why not film on your iPad? Why not do that and just use the phone for phone calls? Uh, so I, I broke out the, the old, uh, the iPad clamping tripod or whatever, and went to put the iPad in the bracket in order to hold it up and give it a try again, and the bracket suddenly doesn't stretch to fit the iPad. Once again, nothing has changed. That bracket fit the iPad the last time I tried it because I made videos on it. I, I, I posted them on this channel. I have no idea why the bracket on that thing doesn't fit anymore, and I know perfectly well what's going to happen if I go online. I'm going to be told it does fit. I'm going to, if I if I ask a question on a tech forum and say here's the, the product number of the, the tripod that I bought on Amazon, they're going to say, well, yeah, if you look at the web at the website, if you look at the manufacturer, they will you will see, yeah, it does fit an iPad in landscape mode. So your 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 bracket does fit your iPad. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't fit my iPad, so I, I don't know what to say about that. <sighs> so I have gone back to my trusty iPhone, which has never let me down except for all the times when it has, <laughs> to film videos on a normal tripod, on a three-legged little tripod, which is bouncing all around because I have it set up on pillows. I, I want to film on my iPad, and I don't know why that bracket doesn't work anymore. I have been all over the thing thinking maybe there's a catch release or something like that that I'm not seeing. It's not there. It just doesn't do what it did only a few months ago. And I just don't want to go back online and shop for a bracket that fits an iPad in landscape mode. I just don't want to do that. Because I know... <laughs> anyway, anyway. Uh, because I have been bedeviled with all of these... Uh, technology problems i thought i would just go back to my feel-good place and that is the mail <laughs> so we're going to do a little bit of mail it's not a lot i'm not going to wait for the mail to accumulate because i wanted to vent and i want to make a video that isn't telling me uh, you know i can't do that dave i don't want i don't want to do that so we'll start with the tls the london times literary supplement this is the greatest literary journal in the world uh and we're not going to read from the letters page today, but I am going to express a little bit of concern with uh, an in-house thing that they did in this issue that I don't agree with at all. Ordinarily, I do, in principle, but not in use like this. There's The first uh, review here is a roundup review of Rare Metals War, The Dark Side of Clean Energy and Digital Technologies by Guillaume Pitron. The World for Sale, Money, Power, and the Traders Who Barter in Earth's Resources by Javier Bla and Jack Fracci and Wars of the Interior by Joseph Zarati. All about uh, this. All about uh, exploited poor people being forced to mine the rare materials that are actually in this iPhone, that are in all of your iPads, that, that the West needs but doesn't have. Uh, and I, I haven't read the Roundup review yet. I will. I'm not going to read any. I'm, I don't have any of these books. I'm not going to reach out to get them. So the review is just going to be for information. But my problem with it is the title. Minor Conflicts. Uh, which is a punny headline on Minor Conflicts. M-I-N-O-R. Uh, and I ordinarily am a huge champion of punny headlines. I have written many of them in my day, but not on a serious subject. You don't do a punny headline on a serious subject. Uh, you're not you're not joking about these, these people oppressed, are you? And I thought, okay, well, that was a bad note. And then I got to the very next review. The very next review is of a book called Scorched Earth, Environmental Warfare as a Crime Against Humanity and Nature by Emmanuel Creakey, Princeton University Press. And the, the headline is War on Terror. Instead of War on Terror, T-E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, another punny, jokey headline on another incredibly serious subject. Not a big deal, you know, but uh, off-putting. Very off-putting. It, it's, uh, it's, how do the uh, the blue check mark fascists on Twitter say it? It's not a good look. It's not going to age well. Yikes. Read the room. <laughs> uh, but anyway, anyway, uh, no, the thing that got me this time around was in the MB section in the back. Uh, 
which is sort of a roving ombud, ombudsman column about all the absurdities of the literary world. And the, the long opening piece is about neologisms, about people making up new words. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a book, uh, what is it, The Hidden History of Coined Words, uh, that's out, and uh, they thought, you know, it'd be worthwhile to trot the whole idea of neologisms around the block. But before they do that, before the writer does that, uh, they indulge in a wonderful little bit of slapping around people, which I love this column for. I was worried that it would go away when its previous writer retired, but the new writer, MC, seems to have the knack, uh, because the, the piece starts off this way. Words strain, crack, and sometimes something, something, something. We quote from memory, alas, and cannot guarantee that this is precisely what T.S. Eliot wrote in those salutary lines from Burnt Norton. Such failures in the recollecting part of the brain remind us to be gentle with those who experience comparable difficulties with language and literature, even as they may be caught in the act of posing as experts in the field. It would not do to ask the publicist who wrote to us on behalf of Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux to announce the publication of a, quote, masterful novel if she meant masterly. It would, not be, it would be hypocritical to ask the poet puffing a peer's new collection if she actually meant to warn us off it by describing its vocabulary as fulsome. <laughs> and let no petulant tut at, variety, at varsity the Cambridge student newspaper for allowing the Cambridge-educated influencer Carolyn Calloway in a recently published interview to state that both Vladimir Nabokov and George Orwell were American writers. You know, like Ernest Hemingway, the author of the book Immovable Feast and then issuing only a partial correction. As every Cambridge student knows, we gotta use words when we talk to one another. Or is that T.S. Eliot again? <laughs> that is choice. Absolutely choice. <laughs> so that is the TLS. There's uh, there's quite a bit in here that I will get to. Uh, I mean, I will read the whole thing, but uh, I didn't off the top of my head notice a whole lot of those butterflies in the, in the stomach kinds of reviews where a major review organ goes after a book, re reviews a book that I myself have also reviewed. You get butterflies in the stomach no matter how much of a veteran you are when that happens because you are, that is the moment when, as the saying goes, the rubber hits the road. That's when you learn whether or not the, uh, the critic that someone else has employed to read the same book you read caught a whole bunch of things you didn't catch. That can be mortifying. It hasn't happened to me. I don't think in a major way ever, but certainly not even in a minor way in a long time. It usually, I, I put work into my reviews. I don't make it sound that way, but I do. I put work into my reviews. So usually, if I read even a very long review of a book that I've already reviewed, my reaction is, well, okay, that is a valid reading, same as mine. You might not have liked the book uh, where I did, or you might much more likely have liked the book when I didn't. Uh, but there's no categorical winner here. It, it's just two people reading the same book. Uh, I may have butterflies in the stomach with the next London review of books. Uh, because my subscription is a little bit odd and a little bit wonky, I usually learn about the new London review of books on Riches and Reads, <laughs> on Mark Richardson's Instagram channel, uh, where he will often uh, post when he gets new bookish-related content in the mail. He got the new London review of books, and it looks to me, just from the cover, like their feature, their feature review is a long review of the new biography of Edward Said. I wrote a review of that book, and uh, uh, it was a little bit on uh, the sharp side. It wasn't a condemnation of the book, but I, I'd be willing. To, I, I was kind. Of, I'm kind of waiting for that book to get a little bit more attention than it has. Uh, and I, this this may be the piece that I'm looking for. And who knows what the author will, will encounter? My guess would be. I haven't seen that issue of the LRB. Who knows when it will get to me? When it does, my guess would be that it will be the author of the piece just winding on about Edward Said and barely mentioning the book itself at all. The London Review of Books has a penchant for pieces like that. I, and, and Edward Said brings it out in people anyway <laughs> to do that. I guarantee you if Christopher Hitchens had still been alive and this book had come out, that is what he would have done. He would have gone to the New York Review of Books and said, I need 3,000 words. And at the end of that 3,000 words, he would have mentioned the book maybe once. <laughs> so, but, and I'm... I'm guessing that that happens in the LRB review. We shall see when I finally get my copy. But in addition to the periodical, we also have a box. It's not much. I realize this mail hall is not big. I just needed to... Uh... <laughs> What's the matter? 
I just needed to make a video. That's all. I've got plenty of other videos that I want to make. Uh, we, and we've done one book mail house before. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see what we have here. Uh, maybe it'll be. Maybe it'll be something really interesting. Let's get that out of the way. What we got here? Oh, ho, 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 yes, indeed, interesting. Okay, uh, all right, no pub sheet on this, but uh, that's all right, we can wing it. This is a subject I know fairly well. Uh, this is by Kent Masterson Brown, and it is Mead at Gettysburg, A Study in Command. This is a new book from uh, the Uni University of North Carolina Press, and it is about George Meade, the, who was in command of the Federal Forces, the Union Forces, at the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, and uh, is responsible for all the good stuff and all the bad stuff <laughs> at, the, at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, he had a major study, uh, I want to say 30 years ago, something like that. Never had a full dress biography, not in the modern light of in the light of modern era, of the era, no. Uh, implicit in the fact that he's never had a full dress biography seems to me to be a kind of concession on the part of the biographers that we don't really care about this man, except as his position leading the Union Army in the Civil War. Uh, I would tend to second that. From what I know about his life, it would make pretty boring reading. But Meade at Gettysburg is not going to be boring, of course. Uh, and it, it, if anything, it's going to be infuriating. Because the, the Union forces, once they consolidated on the high ground at Gettysburg, were in an impregnable position in, uh, according to the tactics that Robert E. Lee was dead set on using. Meade could easily have had his left flank turned. Even as late as the second day at Gettysburg, he could have had his left flank turned. Which might have been disastrous, because I don't see in his military record any ability to think on the fly. He's the perfect guy you want if you're moving him in like a chess piece to a very strong position. But I'm not sure in the kind of uh, fleet-footed, you know, think-on-your-feet engagement that Robert E. Lee, his opponent at Gettysburg, was so skilled at, I'm not sure that he wouldn't have had his clock clean. That he wasn't that kind of a commander. Uh, but that's not where most of the frustration will come in. For, mo for me, anyway, most of the frustration will come in at the end of the Battle of Gettysburg. When Lee's army had been shattered, Lee had, for whatever reason, decided on Pickett's charge. He had, if you have ever been to the Battle of Gettysburg, to the, to the, you know, the historical site of the Battle of Gettysburg, you will be appalled when you look at it. The sheer distance that Lee ordered his men to march at a stiff walk under the guns of the enemy is nothing short of insane. It's, it's, there's nothing, there's no other word for it except that was an insane decision. And yet we know from, from day to day accounts at Gettysburg that Lee was not experiencing a fever. He was not experiencing a, a brain embolism of any kind. He wasn't, in fact, mentally impaired. He made the decision anyway and marched a huge chunk of his strength straight at enemy guns entrenched on the high ground. They were, of course, annihilated. They were simply annihilated. Uh, and as a result, Lee's army at Gettysburg was gored right through its guts. His forces came, you know, running back in tatters. The Union forces did not counterattack, and they didn't pounce on Lee's army the next day either. That was Meade's decision. Meade made that decision. He could have ended the Civil War right then. Because there, there would have been only the smallest ribbons of token resistance if he had captured Lee's army and captured Lee. And that was easily within his ability to do. He had five times the forces, and his were well-stocked, well-ammunitioned, well well-fed, well-rested, uh, and with a gigantic amount of morale. Lee's army had none of that. And a wounded, the, the train of you know carriages and horses with wounded, just screams and cries and moans raining into the territory around Pennsylvania. It, his, his train of wounded was miles long with no ability to protect anything that big, no ability to, to conduct any kind of rear guard action, he was as vulnerable as armies get. And Meade was, might not have been the most brilliant commander in the Union history, but he could see that plain as day, and he let it happen. He let Lee get away. Uh, should have been sacked on the spot. Uh, so Meade at Gettysburg, a study in command, I would say, is a study in the failure of command. Because the ultimate goal of any military command is the annihilation of the opposing force. If you didn't do that when you had it handed to you on a silver platter, then you're a bad commander. 
but we will see we will see what this author has to say on the subject i believe i'm i believe it's true don't don't quote me on it just yet but i think i am reviewing this for the christian science monitor which is uh if i remember correctly those negotiations were a little bit unexpected on my part and and yielded fruit i think i'm doing this i think this is a june release and i think that i'm reviewing this for june uh, for the monitor, which is great, not not just because I love the Christian Science Monitor, a Boston newspaper of old of vintage that I love dearly, uh, but also because it will reach a large audience. That review will reach a large audience, and that's great. Uh, so I will be rehashing all of this. Maybe this author will change my mind on quite a bit. We shall see. I will go at it in great detail. So that is our book, a winner of a book and a winner of a periodical. You know. Tasteless headlines notwithstanding, the TLS is always great news to get in the mail. It's a lot of stuff that I'll be reading and enjoying. Uh, so there you go. That is uh, the day's mail and a little bit of complaining. Uh, tech problems. Complaining about tech problems. That noise you hear is the bean attacking the box. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> oh. oh, hello, baby. You could eat your food instead of eating a cardboard box, you know. You could. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, great. <laughs> oh. <laughs> She doesn't go at it with quite the uh, the will that she once did when she was a puppy, but she does occasionally like to do it. But I'm gonna have to wrap up this. Uh... <laughs> I'm gonna have to wrap up this video and go clean up that mess. Uh, I just wanted to complain about my tech problems. That's all. I would like to use my burner phone to film videos. The videos don't take up much space and. Uh, I'm perfectly happy to delete them as soon as they're uploaded so that there should that space shouldn't be filling up and it is I need to figure out how to clear off that space on the burner phone then we'll be back in business and where I should point out here we're in business anyway the goal of my technology the reason that I don't get blood curdlingly infuriated anymore about technology the way I did even 10 years ago is because I have discovered the value of redundancy I have built in redundancy into my technological life I have much more than just one device on which to film videos that work in uploading them to YouTube. I have much more than one device on which to work, on which to write. I had a perfect case in point like that last week when I, I opened the MacBook Air to get some work done and noticed that the charge was low. The battery icon said 60%, something like that. So I, I have the plug right here easily within reach I plugged it in and it didn't it wasn't charging so I did the whole rigmarole I checked to make sure that there was no hair or fuss in the portal then I checked to make sure that the plug was plugged in then and it wasn't I wasn't getting anything so then I used that same charge plug on another MacBook Air and it also wasn't charging and that's when I knew uh, that the problem was the power cord the power cord had just died uh, so I, I went online right away. I went on Amazon right away. Or no, I actually went on uh, on uh, eBay. Because, no, I went on Amazon. I went on Amazon. I used Amazon Prime so I could get the thing right away. Found the, the appropriate power cord for an older MacBook Air. Ordered it. And avoided the white rage of helplessness. Because I have a Chromebook. I even, if push comes to shove, have much older MacBooks that still work just fine. They still access the internet. It's just documents. Documents don't take up any space at all. They're not hard to do. My first generation MacBook could probably do the work that I need to do for reviewing. I was able to work without any kind of hiccup of interruption. And the same thing is true here, I should point out, with these phones and these iPads and these brackets and these filming. I can still film videos and upload them, more's the pity for you. Uh, I'm not just stopped in my tracks because I have built-in redundancy. There's all sorts of devices here. But nevertheless, I would like to use that burner phone for a lot. I'd rather not use it just as a phone. I hate single-use devices, so I'm gonna have to make I'm gonna have to make a concerted effort to find out what is eating up the space on that thing. Uh, I, if I if I succeed, you'll notice because my volume will be better. You'll be able to hear the next rant even clearer than you're in this one. <laughs> in the meantime, I'm gonna wrap this up, but I'll be back. Thank you, Butch.